Okay. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh. Bismillah walhamdulillah wassalatu wassalam ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahu dahu ila yawmiddin thumma amma ba'du Okay so before we begin inshallah ta'ala like always we're going to do review and we're going to start today's lesson today's class with aqida the belief system that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made incumbent upon us to believe in and that which the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi alayhi has reiterated and tried to instill upon his companions and so forth and we're still dealing with the issue of ulu the issue of ulu we've been reviewing and we've been going over new material, right? We've been reviewing the ayat dealing with ulu. And uh, last uh, last class, we covered the verse where Fir'aun, or Fir'aun, he said to Haman, build for me a tower so that I may reach, use that as a means to reach my goal, which was? To look upon the God of Moses. Right? So Pharaoh wanted to look upon the God of Moses by building something high, going up. So even Pharaoh or Fir'aun, he, he had the understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was up. He was above. Right? He was above. We also covered some statements of the students of the companion, the Salaf, uh, and their different statements which indicate that they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was above. Another verse from the Quran which further reiterate this idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above is what Allah Jalla Jalalu he says about Isa about Prophet Jesus may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him in which he said wa ma qataluhu wa ma salabuhu wa lakin shubbiha lahum they did not crucify him I'm sorry they did not kill him nor did they crucify him rather it was a likeness which was made unto them. And those who disagree in that matter are in doubt. Those who disagree in regards to him are in doubt. They have nothing in this regard. They have nothing to support their claim except for conjecture and guess. And with certainty, they did not kill him. And with certainty, they did not kill him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the next verse, Rather, Allah had raised him to himself. Allah had raised him, lift him up into himself, with him. So Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had, had taken Jesus, saved him from being crucified and killed. And he has been raised to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa kana Allahu azizan hakima and Allah is aziz. Great hakim. 
most wise. So that is another, that is another evidence from the Quran which substantiates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above his creation. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we're going to hear some of the statements of students, of the students, of the companions, and those after them from the Salaf who have said similar to what their teachers have said, to what the Quran has said, and to what the Prophet has said. So, the first person we're going to look at is a statement of Imam Malik. Imam Malik, rahimahullah, he says, Allah fi samai wa ilmuhu fi kulli makan la yakhlu minhu shay. Imam Malik, and Imam, this Imam Malik we're talking about, of course, is the person who is the Imam of one of the four madhabs. And when we say one of the four madhabs, we're not saying there's only four madhabs from the madhahib of Islam. There are more than four, but the popular madhab, right? Imam Malik from the Malikiyya. So when someone says that they're Maliki, they're supposed to be upon the methodology and the teachings of Imam Malik. So what did Imam Malik say about this? Imam Malik, said, Imam Malik he says, that Allah is in the heaven and his knowledge is everywhere. There is no place that is free from his knowledge. There's nothing that is free from his knowledge. وَسَعَلَهُ رَجُلٌ And in another incident, this is with Imam Malik again, is that an individual asked Imam Malik saying, كَيْفَ istiwa Or كَيْفَ istawa? How did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascend? كَيْفَ istawa? قَالَ الْكَيْف غَيْرُ مَعْقُولُ Imam Malik says, الْكَيْف غَيْرُ مَعْقُولُ The how of it, we can't comprehend. The how the Allah ascended, we can't comprehend. وَالِسْتِوَى مِنْهُ غَيْرُ مَجْهُولُ But ascension is something that is not lost to us, meaning that we understand the meaning of the word ascension. وَالْإِمَانُ بِهِ wajib. Having faith, understanding, and knowing, and believing in istiwa that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ascended on his throne is obligatory. And asking about it, meaning asking the how, is an innovation. Meaning that the people before never asked this question. وَالسُوَالُ عَنْهُ بِدْعًا وَإِنِّي أَخَافُ أَنْ تَكُونَ ضَالًا وَأُمِرَ بِهِ فَأُخْرِجَ And then Imam Malik says, I am afraid, I am worried that you might be astray. You might be an individual who has gone astray. So he had commanded that this person be removed from his sitting, and so he was. So that's Imam Malik. Two incidents. Another one. Now this is of, uh, on uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Another Imam from the Imam of the Four School of Thought. Su'ila Abu Abdullah Ahmed, uh, Ahmed, uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Imam Ahl Sunnah. The Imam of Ahl Sunnah. The person said to him, Allah, focus on the Sabir. Or focus on the Sabir. Ala Arshihi Ba'inun Min Khalqihi Wa Kudratihi Wa Ilmihi Bikuli Makan. 
So the person said to Imam Malik that Allah, He's above the seven heavens on His throne, separate from His creation. And His might and knowledge is everywhere. His might, meaning the ability to do whatever He wills, and His knowledge is everywhere. So Imam Malik said, Naam, yes. He is on his throne. There is no knowledge which escapes him. There is no knowledge which escapes him. وَسُئِلَ إِسْحَاقِ بْنُ رَهُوْيَا And Ishaq ibn Rahuya, Rahimahullah, another scholar from the scholars of Islam, he said, I'm sorry, not, uh, not, not he said, but he was asked, وَمَا هَذِي الْأَحَادِيثِ What is the meaning of these ahadith, these narrations, these statements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? تَرَوْنَ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَنْزِلُ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ الدُّنْيَا That say that Allah descends to the lower heavens. قَالَ نَعَمْ رَوَاهَ الثِّقَاتِ أَلَّذِينَ يَرَوْنَ يَرْوُونَ I'm sorry, أَلَّذِينَ يَرْوُونَ الْأَحْكَامِ So, those ahadith in which, which speaks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala de, uh, descending to the lower heavens, Ishaq, uh, Ishaq ibn Rahuya, he said yes. He says yes, those ahadith were narrated by trustworthy trustworthy narrators, the thiqat. And these narrators are known. They are the ones that narrate different ahadith concerning different legislative issues. So the person then asks, does he descend from his throne? Does he descend, like does he get off of his throne when he descends? So Ishaq, he says, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is the same person. So the person says, does he descend off of his throne or is he able to descend while he's upon his throne? Like what does he, how does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descend? قَالَ نَعَمْ قَالَ فَلَمْ نَتَتَكَلَّمْ فِي هَذَا الْأَمْرِ فَلِمَا I'm sorry فَلِمَا تَتَكَلَّمْ فِي هَذَا الْأَمْرِ So Ishaq he says yes meaning that he's able to descend without leaving his throne then he asks him why are you talking about this why are you delving in this issue meaning that it's something that is not uh, praiseworthy the how Allah ascends and descends the how, the how of it is not something that we as servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delve into. Because that will cause you to then having to compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, لَيْسَ كَمِتْمِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ سَمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There's nothing similar to him and he is all-seeing. I'm sorry, he is all-hearing, all-seeing. Okay, the next statement that we have here is from Ibn al-Arabi, Rahimahullah. An individual said to Ibn al-Arabi, Ya Aba Abdullah, ma ma'na qawlu, ma ma'na qawlihi ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa? So the person says, Oh Abu Abdul Rahman, Abu Abdullah, I'm sorry, is Abu Abdullah, yeah, Oh Abu Abdullah, what does Allah mean by his statement, Ar Rahman ascends his throne? Ar Rahman ascends the throne. So Ibn al Arabi, he says, Allah said he's on his throne, he's on his throne. Just like he said, Allah is on his throne. 
فقال الرجل ليس كذاك So the person said, no, nah, no, nah, that's not what it means. إنما معناه استولى The person says, what it really means is that Allah has taken authority. Allah has taken authority. He has become the person that has a rulership and in his dominion. فَقَالَ أُسْكُتْ مَا يُدْرِكَ مَا هَذَا So, Ibn al-Arabi, I'm sorry, Ibn al-Arabi, I'm sorry, Ibn al-Arabi, he says, shut up. What makes you think that? What makes you think that that's what it means? Al-Arab la taqulu li rajul istawla ala shay hata yakun lahu fihi madad. So listen to what uh, Ibn al-Arabi says. He says the Arabs do not say a person becomes or has authority or becomes into authority over a thing unless it, uh, its opposite has happened. The Arabs do not use that word unless the opposite has happened. You can't become, you can't come into the uh, authority of something unless before it you didn't have authority. Right? So he goes on to say, فَأَيُّ مَا غَلَبَ قَبْلَ إِسْتَوْلَى So, Ibn al-Arabi says, so who had authority before he had authority? Who had authority before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had authority? وَاللَّهُ تَعَالَى لَا مُضَادَ لَهُ وَهُوَ عَلَى عَرْشِهِ كَمَا أَخْبَرُ He says, and Allah... There is no... Is it still recording? Mm -hmm. Okay. So Allah, there is no um, rival. He has no rival. And He is upon His throne like He has informed us. He is upon His throne like He has informed us. al istila ba'da al so he says that someone having authority only happens after they have to usurp. They have to get that authority from someone else. And that is something that is incomprehensible when it comes to the status of Allah Jalla Jalalu. Okay, so we're going to stop right there when it comes to the issue of the statements of the scholars in regards to um, Allah and him being above. So any questions on that? Let me see if there's anyone in the comments have any questions before we continue. I think that's pretty straightforward. You know, we've covered a lot of uh, evidence and we're going to continue to go over the evidence. So, so far, brothers and sisters, we've covered evidence from the Quran, the Sunnah, the statements of the companion, the statements of the students of the companion and the statements of the scholars of the past. And this is what is important here. You know, um, just, a quick, just a quick note. When we talk about Quran and Sunnah, most Muslims can agree on that front, right? Most Muslims, you say Quran and Sunnah, they say, of course, yeah, Quran and Sunnah, right? But when it comes to the issue of for example, this issue of Allah being upon His throne, you know, they will interpret the Quran and Sunnah in a way other than what is intended. So in situations, in scenarios on that, what's going to be the criteria? How do we say, well, no, you're wrong? That's not what Allah meant. That's not what the Prophet ﷺ meant. So that's the reason why we have the companions, right? We look at the companions who were there when the verses were revealed. So they understand the intent behind the revelation. And also they are Arabs. So they understand, they understand the linguistic application, right? So they have an understanding. We have to understand that Islam was simple, and it is still simple. But you have to understand, for people that was there when it was revealed, 
they had very little complications when it came to understanding. Did sometimes they misunderstood? Yes. And we, we've covered that. We've covered the example. Like with the issue with the companions when it came to the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا يصلينا أحدكم إلا في بني قريظة Don't any of you pray Salatul Asr. لا يصلينا أحدكم Salatul Asri إلا في بني قريظة Don't any of you pray Salatul Asr until they reach Bani Qurayza. Bani Qurayza, these were um, Jews that lived on the outskirts of Medina and they plotted against the Prophet Muhammad And the Prophet was ready for payback. He knew that they betrayed him. So he told his companion that, uh, that don't pray until you reach them. The companions... When it came to this scenario, this statement, we're of two mindsets, of two understanding. One of the understanding was exactly what he said. He said, don't pray until we reach. We don't pray until we reach. We follow the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that's true, right? I mean, no one would argue about that. We follow the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu He just said, don't pray until you reach there. We don't pray until we reach there. Other companions, they understood something different. They said, no. Let's look at the intent of the statement. The Prophet Sallallahu means for us to hurry, to rush, to hasten. Don't slack when it comes to reaching Bani Qurayva. But he doesn't mean that we keep going until we delay Asr. Because Maghrib is going to come in. If we don't stop and pray, Maghrib is going to catch us before we get to Bani Qurayva. So the, the companions understood that there's no way. See, this is why it's called by, this is why the, the, the scholars say, Al-Bab, إِذَا لَمْ تُجْمَعْ تُرُقُهُ لَمْ يَتَبَيْنْ خَطَأُهُ If a, if a mas'ala, if a, a, um, an issue You don't have all of the pieces All of the pieces of the puzzle It's not going to become clear You're not. So they understand that for example The obligation of, As, uh, of Maghrib I mean of praying Asr on time Supersedes anything There's no way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Is going to tell us to disobey him and Allah When it comes to the obligation of praying Asr on time So that means we have to take that into consideration when we apply the understanding of him saying, don't pray Asr until you reach Bani Qurayva. You have to gather up all the evidence. And that's what we're doing here. So not only do we have the Quran and Sunnah, we have the understandings of the Salaf, right? We have the understandings of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and the other companions. And then we have their students who double down on their understanding, right? Because now we have, not only do we have the statements of the companions, we have their students who had the, the same understandings that they did, backing them up. And then, of course, we have the statements of the, the, the scholars that came after them. You know, showing that lineage, showing that, um, that, that line of knowledge, Going, and that's why you, you, you hear, sometimes you hear the, the, the scholars of the past, they will mention the scholars they studied with, right? And then you'll know those scholars studied with so-and-so and so-and-so, going all the way back to the companion. Like Ibn Mas'ud, for example, a lot of people can trace, like uh, Sheikh Bin Baz, for example, can trace a lot of his knowledge going back to the, the companion Ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud. And you find this in a lot, and so this is one of the benefits of sitting with people of knowledge and not reading from a book. Not saying that reading from a book is wrong, but there's certain things that you can't uncover from reading from a book. One of the scholars of the past, uh, Sheikh Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, you know, um, saying, talking about the issue of reading from a book and studying from a book. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're in a scenario where you can't do it better. That's, that's all you got. But he says that 
When you study from a book, there's no one there to correct you if you have a misunderstanding. That's the issue, right? So the, 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 the scholars used to say that a person who studies from a book, they're going to have more mistakes. That's the only issue. But don't let that deter you from getting knowledge the only way you can. But make sure that you do the you take knowledge the best way you can. So for example, don't say I'm going to study from a book even though there's like 20 scholars right here available or something like that. Don't say I'm going to study from this guy who maybe studied 2 years when there's a person that studied 10 20 years. You know what I'm saying? There's all go for the best that you can if you're able to. All right, so continuing on, we've just finished with the uh, issue of Aqidah, so now we're going to go to Hadith. And we're on the 20th Hadith, the 20th Hadith, from the uh, 40 Hadith of Imam Anawi, Rahimahullah. So the hadith, the 20th hadith is a hadith of Abu Mas'ud Uqba ibn Amir Al-Ansari Al-Badri Al-Ansari Al-Badri So it says An Abi Mas'ud Uqba ibn Amir Al-Ansari Al-Badri Radiyallahu anhu Anahu qaw qala Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam إن مما أدرك الناس من كلام النبوة الأولى إذا لم تستحي إذا لم تستحي فاصنع ما شئ رواه البخاري. This hadith has been narrated by Imam Bukhari, in which he says that the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم هو عليه. He says from the good in which we have inherited, in which has been brought down from the prophetic traditions that were before, is the understanding, is the statement. If you don't have any haya, if you don't have any modesty, do whatever you will. If you don't have any modesty, do whatever you will. So what does this mean? There are several ways that this can be understood. Meaning that if a person does whatever they want, it means they don't have any modesty. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do what I feel. And what they mean by that is total having their impulses have a total hold on them without any restrictions, without any regard. This person has no modesty, nothing to keep them in check. Also, it means that if you have modesty, as long as that modesty is there to help guide you towards making sure that you do not fall into the impermissibility impermissible act acts which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited then you're good another meaning is a warning a warning meaning that don't do something unless you are or if you're not careful Doing that thing which is impermissible shows that you have no, you know, modesty, no haya. And we know that haya is also one of the branches from the branches of faith. The Prophet Sallallahu said, haya shu'batun min al-iman. And also, the Prophet Sallallahu said that haya does not enter, enter into someone or is not become part of someone except for it beautifies that person. Any questions on that? 
Oh, well, actually, I want to uh, take this and kind of go into something. The issue about Haya. Um, and I hope the sister that um, contacted me and asked me this question doesn't mind that I share this, this story because it might be something that's prevalent going around in some of the different communities. A sister contacted me, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, asking me the what is the ruling about a woman during a sit down showing her, her hair and her body, like wearing some tight clothes uh, or something like that. I don't know how I don't know how this works, but somehow showing her hair and her body in a sit down and stuff like that. Now this is after. The person has agreed that he wants to marry her, right? So this is this is the scenario that she gave me. So I said, not permissible. So she said, what's the proof? I said, the proof is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in which he says, who can see the woman from her mahram, from those people that are permissible to be around her? Who can see her? Um, without her hijab So she says that But this person is going is your fiance Basically This person is your fiance I said Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I mean Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Did not mention fiance Mentioned husband But not fiance That person is not your husband yet That person is not your husband yet And then I said The only thing that I've heard from the scholars In this regard Because the scholars have been This This uh, question has been posed to them and she even the sister to, to show you how far this has gone the sister had even said that there's a book out there written by someone uh, regarding this issue and, and talking about the, the, per, the permissibility of it and Anna Kulin there is no hadith that said that you can look on a woman hair and body that you're not married to there's nothing on it but we're going to get into that, uh, where they derive this understanding from, this twisted understanding. But first, I told the sister that there is no scholar that I know of that has agreed to this. But what I've heard, when a scholar, and I don't remember who it was, I was who I was sitting with, which scholar I was sitting with, when he was asked this question, I would like to say maybe Sheikh Abdul al-Bukhari, I'm not 100% sure, um, but he's, he's what comes to mind when I, when I think of this question. He says that how it's done, and look at the difference between how he envisions it happening and how it has come to, is that, you know, when you have interest in a sister, and you speak to her father, which is normally, you know, remember, we're talking about this, he's an Arab, or he lives in, you know, the, uh, where the Arabs are predominant, you know, the Muslims and things like that. So he's doing it from that perspective, right? So everybody has a father who who's Muslim and all this other stuff. So <laughs> we know that that's not our scenario here. Our situation here is different, right? So anyway, he says the father would invite you to the house, right, to talk about your interest in his daughter. And during that, the daughter that you're interested in will be the one that will be hosting you. So she's the one that's bringing in the coffee, the dates and things like that into the room that you and her father is sitting in. The sister is not going to be dressed the way that she's dressed when she's outside in the street. She's not going to be, you know, niqab, black, all whatever the case may be, jilbab, whatever the case may be. She's going to be dressed in what she would wear inside of the house, modest, modestly dressed and stuff like that um, and things. Uh, hair covered. But you know what I'm saying you might see some hand, some arm feet whatever the case may be and the and the the garment that she's wearing might not be as loose as it would be if uh she was wearing it outside he said that at that time you can take the opportunity while she's going around pouring tea and coffee and stuff like that to get your look you know what I'm saying see what you can off her now notice in none of that is she dressed in a way that is impermissible? This is important for us to understand, brothers and sisters. Don't make anyone force you 
I mean, unless, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if the sisters are actually being forced, to be honest. <laughs> All right, we got, we got somebody here that wants, that wants to make a comment. The fudl, I have a question. Fudl. No. So say, for instance, it would it be permissible, like, okay, I, and I get that part of mm-hmm. what you're saying. Let's say the hair thing. Mm-hmm. It would it be permissible for somebody in his family? Like, yeah, I mean, but, okay. To say, hey, you know, I, I, that she could show her hair to her and she mm-hmm. could say, look, no. There's no patches, mm-hmm, you know. Mm-hmm, there's mm-hmm. no Jerry curl there, nothing like that, you know. She just it, okay. It's cold. Okay, so let's talk about a woman uh, looking at the hair of another woman. There's there's a slight difference of opinion amongst the scholars. We're not going to get into that because the correct opinion is that a woman, uh, a Muslim women, can see the hair of Muslim women. Now, see, there's a difference of opinion, right? Because what are we? What about non-Muslim women and stuff like that? Difference of opinion. Right, but inshallah ta'ala when it comes to the Muslim women they can show they can have their hair shown in front of each other so with that being said can you as a man send one of your female relatives to give you the information you need as far as if hair is important to you you want to make sure she's not bald headed don't have any patches things like that right and it's important I mean men we we have certain things that we take as uh, I wouldn't say priority, but things that we deem a must or important. Thank you, important when it comes to uh, issues of our partner, and we are are very physical uh, beings. We 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 are very much into the physical, you know, being uh, pleased with what we see. So yes, this is something that's, that is important to a lot of us. So yes, you can send your mother, sister, or whoever to look, or the sister can send a picture to someone that you know, you know what I'm saying, that can take a look if that if it necessitates that and stuff. Or you can just ask the sister if you believe that she's going to be truthful, because some sisters, subhanAllah, it's like they're, they live in like some reality that's not based on earth. Like, you know, first of all, they're the best looking person on the planet Earth, you know, and nothing about them. There's no defects. So if you ask them, you know, you have long hair, they're here, they're here to be an inch long. And they say, of course, my hair is flowing. You've never seen anything longer than it. I'm like Rapunzel. You not, probably don't know who Rapunzel is, do you? Yeah, you. You know Rapunzel? Okay, they still read that stuff? Okay, cool. All right, I don't know. I thought it was like too old or something. People actually read that anymore. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's crazy how delusional some women are uh, when it comes to their looks. So if you, some women, you can't trust them to actually give you an accurate depiction of what's going on with their self and their situation. You ask them if they have an athletic body, they'll say yes, when that's not the case. You ask them, are they tall? They'll say yes, when they're like four feet five. I mean, who knows? So, in in that type of scenario, if you if you are in that type of situation, and you can get some a female relative to confirm some of these things that you're not able to see for yourself, then uh, there's no problem in that. Okay. So that's the forty hadith, very short um, lesson about haya, about having modesty, and about the person who doesn't have modesty. They'll do a lot of things that is abhorrent and despicable. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save us from that and from not having any modesty. Now I'm seeing, hold on, let me make sure that nobody's, um, nobody is um, commenting. Okay. All right, so far, no questions so far in, in the um, chat, so that's good. Okay, so now let's move on to um, Sira. Now, in Sira, we covered something that happened 20 days after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his prophethood. What happened 20 days after his prophethood? Who remembers from last class? 20 days after his prophethood, what happened? An event happened. That's mentioned in the Quran. I wasn't here, but I can take a stab at it. Take a stab. Is it when he, is this when... No. 
No, that's 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 actually something we're gonna come to. Uh, actually, that's that's what we're gonna talk about. That happened for. Uh, wait, let me not okay. give that away. But um, no, twenty days after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh was made a prophet you know the angel jibril came to him this is when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he fortified the heavens making sure that no jinns can go to the heavens and try to take any news from there mix it with lies and then bring it back to the people and stuff like that and then you know claim that they know the future and know what's going to happen and know people's um um fortune so that happened 20 days after a prophethood. Now, what we're going to talk about now is what happened four years after prophethood. So, four years after prophethood, the Sheikh he says here, "Thumma da'a fi arba il awami bil amri jahratan il al Islami. Thumma da'a fi arba ti or fi arba il awami bil amri." So after four years After the prophethood of the Prophet Sallallahu Before that The da'wah that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was given Was giving Was all in secret Four years He was giving da'wah in secret Talking to his friends, his close friends And things like that Letting them know about Allah The oneness or the obligation of worshiping Allah alone Allah's oneness and things like that Calling his close, the closest people to him To Tawheed After four years Is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Commanded him To uh, To call out loud That means everybody Everybody has to know about Islam And this is when There, there became open Opposition to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his da'wah You know, uh, Ibn Qayyim he said وَأَقَامَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ ثَلَاثَ سِنِينَ يَدُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ So he said, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after the four years Spent uh, three years calling to Allah Or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, after the four years He started calling to Allah out in the open when this was revealed فَاصْدَعْ بِمَا تُؤْمَرْ I mean, بِمَا تُؤْمَرْ فَاصْدَعْ بِمَا تُؤْمَرْ وَأَعْرِدْ عَنِ المشركين. Be firm upon that which you were commanded and avoid the idolaters. So after that was revealed, and this is in Surah Al-Hijr, he says, after that was revealed, he started being public with calling the people to Islam. And this is when the people started trying to oppose him, trying to harm him, and so forth until until the Prophet Sallallahu had to leave uh, Mecca or his companions had to leave Mecca the Prophet Sallallahu stayed a little while longer until he left to uh, al Medina. okay so now we're gonna go to the last part of the class which is Al-Fiqh now we covered in Fiqh we're talking about the prayer. We covered the obligatory acts of prayer. Who can mention some of the obligatory things we have to do in prayer? Not pillar. Not pillar. We, we separated between pillar and obligation. A pillar, is so, if you don't do it, your salat doesn't count. Obligation, if you do it, I mean, I'm sorry, if you don't do it, out of forgetfulness, of course, uh, you can make it up by doing sujood, asahu, right? So we're talking about those issues. So those issues of obligation. Now, why is this important? Like, what, what would be a perfect scenario where it is important for you to know about obligations and uh, pillars and sunnah when it comes to the prayer? Who would this help? A beginner. A beginner. Thank you. Exactly. A beginner would know a beginner who can't manage all of this stuff. They just need the bare bones, minimum thing that they need to do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept their prayer. And if you actually look at the, um, the pillars, all of them is this action. All, all, besides Allahu Akbar, 
and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, all you have to do is do the movement. That's the pillars. So they can do the actual actions if that's all they know how to do and their salat will still be counted. And then they can work on the statements and stuff like that, like, okay, work on Surah Al-Fatiha. Work on what you say when you're bowing. Work on saying, Sami'allahu liman hamida rabbana wa lakal ham. You know, work on what you say in prostration. Work on what you say when you're in between prostrations. All of that could be worked on. The, but the thing that would make his salat valid, it only takes a person two minutes to get those actions straight. Like, you know, the bowing. Okay, stand up first. Allahu Akbar. Bow. Go into bowing. Get up from bowing. Go into prostration. Sit. Go into prostration again. Like that. And he works on those movements until he's able to learn the obligatory statements and actions in the prayer. And then he can add on to that, then the sunnah, right? Those things that are sunnah. So, what did we cover from the obligatory actions? We covered Surah Al-Fatiha. What else did we cover? Also, not just Surah Al-Fatiha, but according to the, the Imam here, uh, uh, Anabalusi, he also said that another surah with it. So Surah Al-Fatiha, basically recitation in general, right? Uh, surah Al-Fatiha and another surah in the first two uh, rakah is obligatory, right? It is wajib. Something that you have to do in your prayer. But it's not a pillar. So if you forget it, your salat is not invalid, you have to make it up by doing sujood asahu, the, the prostration of forgetfulness. Okay. What else? What is this obligatory that we covered last class? I've read hadith before. Mm -hmm. as as it's, as as it's a shahud. Mm -hmm. as being obligatory. Yes. The tashahud, which we covered, is obligatory. The tashahud is obligatory. And of course, that's the, that's the uh, tashahud in the uh, first uh, and last. Um, yeah, I mean, both of them. Basically, the last one. Whatever is the last um, uh, sitting, the tashahud. Also, Rukur, Sujood, uh, being, tra being, how do you say, being, um, having a pause in each movement. Uh, I think we, we say like having a, a little rest in between each of the different uh, movements. That is obligatory, right? So when you stand up, you don't go directly into Rukur, you have a pause. And that's the reason why the scholars say that this is the wisdom behind having different things that you say in each in each uh, position, right? So you have something to say which gives you time for you to be in that position of being relaxed or whatever before you go. Okay, so now you go, you say, you know, uh, Allahu Akbar after reciting, you go into Rukur. And then you have something to say there. Whether it's once, twice, three times, actually not twice, but once or three times, you have something to say. Some scholars say the minimum is three. Some scholars say the minimum is one, right? But with one, the goal of you being there in that position, you know what I'm saying, locked in, has been met. So that's why some of the scholars say that you only have to say it once because that goal is met. Why some scholars say that you have to say three times because Prophet Sallallahu said it three times, right? So... Here we go into intention behind legislation, or do we go with the apparent meaning, or do we go with intent? And you're always going to see that, the, the, those conflicts. Some of the scholars looking at the intent behind th something, and some are looking at just the apparent meaning of the hadith, right? We know the Prophet ﷺ, when he would uh, pray, he would do the adhkar, he would do the supplication, the things that are said in the prayer three times. There is nothing that said that he did it less than three. We don't have no narrations for that. But then you have the other scholars that say, hmm, why do we have these adhkar, these supplication in these specific uh, actions or in these specific uh, parts of the prayer? Ah, the reason why is to give an individual that's praying 
enough time to meet the obligation of being in that position for uh, some time. And that obligation is met by just saying that supplication once. So they say one is enough. Okay. Um... So yeah, those were some of the things that we covered from the obligatory actions. So now we're going to go into the sunan. The sunan. So the sunan, these are things that are encouraged for an individual to do or say in the prayer. But if he doesn't do it or say it, it doesn't mess up his salat. And he doesn't have to pray sujood asahu. You know, the, the prostration of forgetfulness if he doesn't say it. Some of these things are controversial. Some of these things, difference of opinion. You know, other scholars put them in different categories and so forth. So let's take a look at some of them. And you guys are going to be surprised what some of them are. You're going to say, oh, I thought that was obligatory. Oh, I thought, you know, whatever the case may be. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do or talk about that is Sunan is raising the hands to the ears when you say Allahu Akbar. Right, you're, the, the, when you enter in your prayer, you raise your hands to the air. Now, some scholars, they say to the air, meaning like, like, like this. Some say to the air, touching it. There is no hadith to substantiate touching the ears. Like this stuff, there's no hadith. What the companions have said is that the Prophet's hands would be in line with his ears. The Prophet's hands would be in line with his ears. And some scholars, so, so why then do some people touch their ears? Where did that come from? It's the, un, okay, so some scholars, you could kind of say that they probably went to extremes. What I mean is, they say it, to make sure that a person does the act of getting close to their ear, they say that the way to ensure that it's by touching it. Right, so because someone might say, you may say get close to the ears and it might do this. They might do that. They might not get where they, it needs to do. But they, they're sure that if you touch the ears, you at least got there at one point or another, you got to where it needed to go. So that's where they got that from. But whether their intention was good or not, Prophet Sallam didn't do it. So let's try and stick to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, which was put his hands close to his ears, in alignment with his ears. So even that has different understanding amongst the scholars. In alignment with the ears, meaning that like this, right? That's an alignment. That's, that's about the same level as your ears. Some say like this. So it's like from the, uh, I guess that would be, what's that? Um, across from it at the same level. You know, so some of them do it like this. Some of them do it like this. The point is, any one of those will be good. But the, this thing, don't do that. Don't do that. Nothing to, so, to substantiate that. And that is from the sunnah. All right? The next thing is, the Imam saying out loud the takbir. Right? When he does, when he goes into the salat, he begins salat, he says, Allahu Akbar out loud. That's from the Sunnah. That means that a person who is praying by themselves or a person who is following the Imam, according to this scholar, does not say Allahu Akbar out loud. What we mean by out loud is in a way that the person next to you or more can hear him. That means that you whisper it. So you, like you know, like that. Like you would the rest of the, the things in the prayer, according to the statement of this Imam. Okay. Go ahead. What if, you know, you got a hundred people that you may be They covered that. Okay. So this is a good question. You got a massive crowd of people praying with the Imam and it is so crowded that some of the people who are far away, for one reason or another, maybe there's no microphone or whatever the case may be, they can't hear the imam uh, when he says, Allahu Akbar. In this instance, it perm it's permissible for one of the person who, who is uh, following the imam to relay that takbir to those uh, behind him or next to him if he can hear it. Right? So it's a way of relaying the parts of the prayer because people either can't see the imam or can't hear the imam to know what's going on. That is totally fine. Nothing wrong with that. That's what you were asking, right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so the next 
the next Sunna thing, which is problematic, there's a difference of opinion in it, is after the takbir, placing your hands underneath your navel. Right, so this Imam, he takes the position that you can place the, uh, the, the hands underneath the navel when you're standing up, right, uh, during the prayer. Differences of opinion. And I think we covered this before. Um, there is no hadith on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that is authentic, that specifically tells you where to put your hands. There's a hadith that tells you to put it underneath the navel. It's weak. Right? There's a hadith that tells you to put it on your chest. It's weak. We know that the Prophet used to put it somewhere. The closest, the most authentic thing we have, and this is something that I researched like my first or second year uh, in school. You know, because this was a you know, big, we have, this is a big issue for students and stuff like that. Uh, looking at the statements of the scholars, the most authentic thing that we have as far as where to put the hands is the statement of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu explaining the tafsir of Allah's statement for salli li rabbika wan har and pray to your Lord wan har and sacrifice. Now how did Ali interpret this statement to mean where to put your hands? Because when we're talking about sacrificing here, we're talking about a specific animal. Each animal that we sacrifice are sacrificed differently. A chicken, why do, how do we sacrifice a chicken if there is such a thing? <laughs> sacrificing a chicken. How do we kill a chicken? So this throat. A, co uh, a goat? Pretty much the same thing, right? Lay it down, slit its throat. Is there any animal we don't slit its throat? We don't need a sacrifice. We, we, I mean, a fish, we don't even need a sacrifice. So which animal do we sacrifice, but we don't slit the throat? Let's say there's one and a half animal. There's, there's, there's one animal where you can slit its throat or you can do something else. But there's one animal that you could only do this one thing to. You guys have seen all different animals sacrificed before? You seen a cow? A cow. Uh huh. A goat. A goat. A sheep. A, a lamb. lamb. So there's this, there's the one missing that you haven't seen. What is it? A camel. Yes. A camel. You do not slit its throat. You stab it right here. Wow. Just just stick the knife right in there, and that's it. It's called nahar. Uh, right. So yeah. So it's for salli li rabbika one har har. It's from the word nahar, meaning to sacrifice by stabbing it right here. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he did his tafsir of nahar. In this verse, he says to put your hand, your right hand, over your left hand and put it close to the nahar. Close to the place where the animal would be sacrificed, which is right here. So the closer you can get it to, that's why you, maybe you see some people, they pray like this all the way up here. That is like an extreme understanding of that tafsir, right? But what it means is to get it close as you can naturally, right? Which will be like right here on the chest. And that's the most authentic thing that we have as far as where to put uh, the hands. But listen to this now. The sheikh, he says for the man to put their hands underneath the, the navel. But then he says for the women to put their hands on their chest. Where did he get this difference from? There's no hadith. He said because when a woman puts their hand on their chest, it allows them to cover more of their body. So that's, that's the logic, I guess you can say. But does that have a place when we talk about, you know, religious rulings? You know, we have to be careful. You know, and we're going to see some very interesting things from some scholars when it comes to rulings. They're going to say something is from the sunnah, even though there's no hadith to support it. Because they think that it's something in general, it's Something that's encouraged, All right? So we're gonna we're gonna have to uh, watch out for certain things like that, right? Okay.
The next thing. Did I just delete the whole? Okay, no, I did. Okay. The next thing that is from the Sunnah is reciting the opening praise, whispering, meaning reciting it to yourself, right? Whispering the opening praise. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa ta'ala wa taba'a wa. وَتَبَارَكَ اسْمُكْ وَتَعَالَ جَدُّكْ وَلَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُكْ Alright? Um, this opening praise is from the Sunnah to say it. So, once again, we have that new Muslim in front of us. Is the first thing that we're going to say to him, Oh, you got to memorize this. You got No. There are more important things for him to start with. And that is why these things, knowing these things are important. Right? Uh, the next thing, which um, might be some some con contra controversial to some people, is the the ta'awud. What does ta'awud mean when we say ta'awud? What's that? Ta'awud. Something that you say when you say "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim that's ta'awud. Yes. It is too. That's another word for it. Yes, it, there's two. There's two nouns uh, for it and stuff. It's the ada or ta'awud, right? So, saying "A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim is sunnah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. There's uh, basically there's about three different opinions in that issue, um, and that's what we were, that was going to be number seven. Number seven is saying Bismillah. According to the Sheikh, saying Bismillah before you start reciting is Sunnah, which means. That he doesn't believe that Bismillah is part of Surah Al Fatiha. Okay, that's one thing. Because if you believe that Bismillah is part of Surah Al Fatiha, then the issue is over with. You have to say it, right? So, when he says that you don't say Bismillah, it say, this shows that the, the Sheikh believes that um, it's not part of Surah Al Fatiha. Which is kind of interesting because in the Riwayat Al Hafs, in the narration of the Quran that's been. Uh, sent, uh, that goes through the uh, the chain of Hafs, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is part of Surah Al-Fatiha. So, I researched this issue too a long time ago. And with all the difference of opinion amongst the scholars, I think that it becomes a lot easier if you look at it from the way that I've just suggested. What narration of the Quran, what recitation of the Quran is the Scholar are going with. Because in some of the recitations of the Quran, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim is part of Surah Al Fatiha. And if it is part of Surah Al Fatiha, then the job is done. You know what you have to do, part, part of what you have to do, right? Which is you have to recite it. Because part of the Surah, you can't leave part of the Surah out. So for basically, that means for most of the people in the West, because we read. And we recite from from Hafs, we should be saying Bismillahir Rahman Rahim because it is part of the, the the recitation of the Quran that we have. Okay. So that's one part of the, the, the problem. The other part now is do we recite it out loud or do we recite it to ourselves? And according to the companions, especially Uthman, you recite it to yourself. So you have to say it, but you say it to yourself, right? And then you say the rest of it out loud, okay? And then that way you co you you combine all of the narrations, and you get uh, that you get to um, basically combine all the different statements of the scholars and things like that. So you, yes, it's obligatory for you to recite it because it's part of the ayah, and that's the um, the recitation that we recite here in the West. We're not. Um, in Morocco, where they recite Warsh, or wherever else, they recite the other. Um, uh, I think Africa somewhere they recite the other two. Um, 
different um, recitations. But we recite Hafs and Hafs makes Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, the Basmala as it's called, part of Surah Al Fatiha. So now we have to know also as well, because there are narrations where we know that the Prophet started reciting with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. The solution to that is that he didn't recite it out loud. He recited it, he whispered it to himself, and then he recited Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen out loud for everyone else. So that way we kind of work with all those different narrations together. Okay. Saying Ameen is Sunnah. Okay. Um, when we're talking about the Imam who says it to himself, and the people who are being led by the Imam, do they say it out loud or to themselves? Difference of opinion amongst the scholars. <laughs> You're going to hear that a lot, especially when we talk about issues of fiqh. There's so much difference of opinion. I mean, there's, rarely there's an issue where there's no difference of opinion. Okay, just, just so you know, off, off rip. Okay, so, saying I mean, the correct opinion, and Allah knows best, or the strong, I should say, the stronger opinion is that you recite it out loud, right? So, because there, there's a hadith where it said that the, the, you can hear the companion say, I mean, you know, so much that it would, it would like, almost like it, it, it reverberates and stuff like that. So, that, that should be enough proof to show that we should say it out loud. Well, let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So, the fact, we've been in situations where people have learned the Salah before, mm -hmm. and we're used to saying, I mean, mm -hmm. out loud. Mm -hmm. So if they don't say it, can the Muqtadi still say Amin? Yeah, okay. they can say it. So the Muqtadi, they can say Amin even though the Imam doesn't say it. But the Imam, the imam according, depending on which uh, opinion the person takes, you know, he says it to himself or he says it out loud. But he should say it, the Imam should say it, whether it's to himself or out loud. So the, the, the Muqtadi, the Muqtadiyun, they can either say it out, uh, they should say it out loud too as well, if you take the uh, opinion that that is the stronger of the proofs, or the stronger of the opinion. Okay, so the next thing that is the Sunnah is the Salat Ibrahimiyyah. Or, you know, when he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. Saying this is Sunnah. So this is something that happens after the, the Tashahud. So it's not part of the Tashahud. It comes after the Tashahud. Right? So the Tashahud is Atahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibatu Assalamu alayka ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh That's the Tashahud. And then after that, if you say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, this is the, the tasliyah or what's known as Salat Ibrahimiyyah, the Salat upon Ibrahim, or the Abrahamic Salat, or, or what's the word for Salat again? Supplication. Um, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's one of Da'wah uh, Sharifa and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, next thing is. This is also a difference of opinion, and uh, the, the correct opinion is that you don't have to do this, but supplicating when you're in sajda, supplicating when you're in sajda is sunnah, right? That's why we say you don't have to say it, right? Sunnah. But the type of supplication that you say here should be something that ha has been legislated or close to the wording of it is close to that which you can find in the Quran or sunnah. Try to be as close to the Quran and sunnah as possible. When you supplicate, when you're in prostration. Well, I got a question about mm -hmm. that. So you can't, for instance, if you're going through something personal, mm -hmm. you can't. You're not, you're not supposed to make du'a in that position. You can make you can make du'a in that position, okay. but I mean, try to use wording that's close to, like you know, like you know, say Allahumma asli asli shu'uni or something. Like that. Oh, oh Allah, rectify my affairs, like something like that. You know what I'm saying? Close to uh, uh, the the uh, the Quran as soon as possible. Okay. And remember, we say close to the Quran and Sunnah as possible, but not Quran. You can't recite Quran in any other um, place in the in the uh, Salat except standing. Okay. All right. Okay. So next we have 
standing straight up after bowing. So getting up after bowing uh, uh, is we, we were talking about bowing, meaning that you know in, when you're in between the two, bow prostrating, right? You bow. Uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. Standing up, bowing, meaning that you know you're going to rukur. Standing all the way up straight, that is uh, sunnah, meaning that, meaning okay, th th there's a problem, right? There's a problem there because we just said that you have to be tranquil in all of the different positions. So that's an issue. What the imam brought up. Which shows that there's a difference of opinion, right? Because some scholars say that it is, some scholars say that it's not. Um, so what he's saying that is basically the person before they get totally straight, their body gets totally straight by standing, and they go back, they go or they go down into uh, prostration, that they their salat is still okay. And also the same thing too as well. If a person is prostrating, and instead of getting up and sitting, they just go like this, and they go back down. According to some opinion, that's okay as well. Because the thing is, they're saying that um, the sitting that is in between the two prostration is sunnah. The sitting that's in between the two prostration is sunnah. So going up for that is not problematic. It's if you're going into another pillar. Like, you know, all right, you did your two uh, uh, prostration. Now you got to stand up. To get get to uh to, to uh, you know to recite, right. that is a pillar. So you got to you got to do that. You can't like you know almost you know get up and then go into bowing. You can't do that because then you'll be missing a pillar and stuff like that. And then that of course invalidates your salat. So there's there's a lot of you know I'm there's a lot of iffy things here. We're not gonna get into um delving deep into the proofs and stuff like that and really hashing out these issues to kind of get rid of the confusion because. We have to get more confused before we have to get unconfused. And we're not there yet. So you know. you saying what you just said. Mm -hmm. you, you go into the Jew, mm -hmm. and then usually so the first Jew, mm -hmm. goes the Jew, and then we go like this. Yeah. And we might say, Allahumma Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we go back down. You're mm -hmm. saying it's okay to go to one way from, to one way from, to one way from. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Yeah. That's what they're saying. So basically, the, the, the brother asks, okay, so you went, to, you did your first suju, right? Subhana, subhana rabbi la'ada. You get up, you know, for the sitting, but instead of sitting, you go back down, right? And you do your second suju. Is there anything wrong with that? It doesn't invalidate your salat. Did you uh, go against the sunnah? Yes. Yes, you did. Right? So of course, it's not something that's highly praised, but... Or encourage, but it wouldn't break your it wouldn't break your salah, or invalidate your salah. Okay. The next thing we have is saying Allahu Akbar between the different uh, the different um, movements, right? So other than other than the first takbir, we're talking about you know the other like you know in between. The uh, the different prostrations and stuff like that, saying Allah with Baal and things like that, uh, that is considered from the Sunnah. Does it make sense, right? Problematic, yes. No, um, and there's listen, there's a there's, we're gonna cover all of these things in detail. There's a reason why some of the scholars say that these things are Sunnah, right? And I'm just just to, just to kind of get you guys in a sense of where they're coming from. You guys know the hadith that talks about the person who pray, prayed badly? The, that hadith. Like a chicken pecking. Yes. Yeah. That hadith about the person who prayed badly, the person, the one that came to the Prophet ﷺ after praying. The Prophet ﷺ keep on telling him to go back and pray because you didn't pray. When the Prophet ﷺ taught him how to pray, did he mention saying Allah Akbar in each of the movements and stuff like that other than, you know, the first? No, he didn't. Now the scholars, remember, the scholars are looking at this hadith, and they're like thinking to themselves, "This is the chance for the Prophet to teach this person what's going to make his salat count." Because he wasn't praying right before, so the Prophet here is a chance to mention every single thing that if he don't do it, his salat will be invalid. He and all of these things that are meant that we just mentioned, the Prophet did not mention them in that hadith. So that's how the scholars get to the. Now you are thinking that you know. How could they not say Allah Akbar is one of the things that you have to say? Prophet didn't say it in this hadith. 
And that's you. So, okay, so that's where this, those some of those scars are coming from. But remember, what did we say? Any issue that if you don't gather up all the pieces, the, the whole thing is not going to be made clear. It's like a puzzle. You can't just have one part of the puzzle and think that you can solve it. Like, oh, okay, I know what this, this picture is going to be. You need all the pieces of the puzzle before you can make a determination of what needs to happen or what's being said. So, yes, that hadith tells us what is obligatory. But there's other hadith too as well. Okay. The last thing. You got another question? Go ahead. You didn't say anything about it, but I've also seen this too. Mm -hmm. In terms of before people go back up into Kiyan, mm -hmm. they pause for a minute mm -hmm. and then get back up. Okay. So is that legitimate? There's a hadith on that. There's a hadith that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would sit uh, and rest a while. Okay, the question is, before someone gets back up in Qiyam, right, they, they, um, they're, they're, they're in uh, sajda, they're, they're prostrating. Before they get back up to stand up, um, to go do their second or the th their third uh, rakah, they, they pause sitting before getting back up. There is a hadith to substantiate that on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that is authentic. Okay, so uh, that is something that you can practice if you so choose. But that hadith does not substantiate its obligation. It is something that is sunnah. And that is why some scholars don't really uh, mention it when it comes to uh, the prayer. Pause a little bit for the uh, then. Okay, so it's good. Okay, still no questions. Okay, so before we end, because this is going to be the last thing, is being focused and mindful of Allah while praying is from the Sunnah. Being focused and mindful of Allah while praying is from the Sunnah. Because we know a person's mind drifts, right? In and out it goes. Is is do I have food for tomorrow? What I gotta what I gotta do after um after lunch? You know, did I pause my game? For some of us who play video games, or is it still running? Or did or did my kid's sister unpause my game while I'm praying? Right? Cause someone you know you might have somebody in your house that's that that's that's not uh, old enough to pray, and they're doing all types of stuff while you're praying and stuff. So you're thinking about what they might do and things like that. So. Being focused and lasered in on Allah and His greatness throughout the Salat and stuff like that is from the Sunnah. It's something that you should uh, try to do, and uh, but it's very hard. So you know that's the reason why it's not obligatory and it's and it's not a pillar because something that you know it, it gets us uh, all of us and stuff like that. Well, let me ask you a question mm -hmm. about that. With your suggestion. How would you? Uh, what would you suggest to somebody? Because we're talking about for sure. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. in terms of what's your suggestion in terms of somebody being able to be better at, at doing having for sure Okay, so the question is what can somebody do to better their results when it comes to having for sure? One thing that would help is when it comes to their prayer, choose where you pray wisely. A place that is that there's not a lot of traffic. Not a lot of onlooker. If you can get a musalla, an area that's specifically designed for prayer, the better. Not a lot of noise, a place that's cut off from high noise or heavy noise, because that might be distracting. Also, the area that you pray in, make sure that it's free from anything that will distract you. Any colors, images, and things like that that will distract you from your prayer, make sure that those things aren't there. Words too as well. You'll be amazed at what your mind will focus on if it's given free reign, like you know, like something something that's written there, you probably be reading the whole thing. If there's a dictionary in front of you while you're praying, you might try to read that dictionary while you're in your, in your salat. So, getting rid of anything that might distract you is, is optimal. Um, also, before you begin, have that intent to try to make the the uh, uh, attempt to be focused. 
And even though sometimes we might fall, uh, fall short, we should try to make that attempt. And inshallah ta'ala, doing that, having that niyyah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, try to strengthen you along with those other preparations that you make, bismillah ta'ala. Um, so with that, if there aren't any more questions, I, I, we can hand it. I, what I, I would like for you, I'm hoping certain people are, are, are listening to you. Mm. I would like for you to give your opinion about people stating their intention before they make the salah. Okay. Saying, salah goes far to two rakats. Yeah. Salah, okay. Thing. Where does that come from? Is that part of the Islam? Is that part of the sunnah? Where you know, we kind of touched on issues and scenarios like that. Okay, the, the question was people uh, stating their intention when it comes to the prayer out loud. This is something that has perplexed me for a long time. Because listen to this. I've been doing research on that issue for a while and trying to find out the source of where it came from. Because from what I know there is not a scholar from the past anyway that would say that that's from the Sunnah. And that is something that the Prophet ﷺ encouraged. There is no hadith to substantiate saying your intention out loud. But I did find a book in which one scholar, after saying that there's no hadith to support it, he still says that it's recommended that you do it. How he arrives at that, I have no idea. That's the crazy part. How you can say the Prophet ﷺ, they never did it, never encouraged it, but then you're going to do it and encourage it. It's the strangest thing I've ever heard. And that's something that we can't, we can't support that. You know, the scholar, you know, might, might have had a good intention in that, but there's nothing we can't. The only time when we state our intention that is known is when, when we state our intentions out loud. When do we, when is the only time we do it? That's authenticated on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Think of all the acts of worship that we do. Nope. No, it's not fasting. Hajj. Hajj. You were close, but Hajj. So the only time we state our intention out loud is Hajj. Why do we do it? Because the Prophet ﷺ did it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Khudu ani manasikakum. Take from me your rites and rituals of Hajj. And from that is him saying, لَبَيْكَ Allahumma Umrah. O oh Allah, I'm here to make Umrah. Or لَبَيْكَ Allahumma Hajj. Or oh Allah, I'm here to make Hajj. You know, you say your intention out loud. Any other instance and scenario, never have we had in a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ uh, said his intention out loud. So we know that he can do it because he did it for the Hajj. So we know he had the ability. We know that he could do that. But he's never did it except for in Hajj. And the scholar, here we have a scholar who says with his own words that the Prophet ﷺ has never done it in, in the Salat, but I'm going to tell you to do it. The crazy, it's crazy to me. I can't, I can't justify that. And I don't see how he can. So, but we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our scholars who have made, you know, they have shortcomings and things like that. Like we, we would want uh, to be forgiven for our own shortcomings. Uh, and we, we move forward with sticking to the sunnah and leaving it at that. We'll end class right there. Subhanakallahumma bihamdi wa bihamdi. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah. Thank you so much for listening to the Salat Ibrahim Show. Thank you so much for listening to the Salat Ibrahim Show. Thank you so much for listening to the Salat Ibrahim Show. Thank you so much for listening to the Salat Ibrahim Show.